You are listening to part one of our two-part symposium with Teal Scott. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia. I'm Gemini, and we are welcoming Teal Scott, author of The Sculptor in the Sky, with us this evening. Teal is a spiritual catalyst, both accepting and utilizing her clairvoyant, clairsentient, and clairaudient abilities. She manipulates electromagnetic fields and has the ability to communicate with thought forms and reminds people of the united energetic nature of this universe. She teaches others how to create and find bliss in the midst of even the most extreme circumstances. You can learn more about Teal Scott at thespiritualcatalyst.com. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, Teal. Thank you for having me. The first question is by Bridge. Hi, Teal. Uh, Hello. You've mentioned that the uh, vibration of the planet is changing or the planet is evolving. And Could you talk about how that is affecting us all? Well, the law in this universe is that if, if we're living in the same space, our vibrations have to match. So we are all living on the planet Earth, living in the universe. So when the vibration of the Earth and the universe goes up in frequency, we have to match that frequency in order to even stay alive. So as this frequency is increasing, you're going to start seeing major Earth changes, which we've already started seeing with all our climate issues that we've been having lately. (laughs) Um, With people, this is going to translate into majorly increased creativity levels, increased learning and memory We are going to be receptive to information which is beyond the normal limits of our awareness and our consciousness. There is going to be less transition between waking and dreaming. We could consider that in body and out of body because as the frequency increases, the third dimension is going to be much more close to the fourth dimension in frequency, meaning that people will have a harder time differentiating between consciousness states. And this is a time of seriously rapid change, meaning that those of us who are kind of messing around in our day-to-day lives and not really making a a real study of our own consciousness and of our own evolution are going to be thrown into it. We're going to be catalyzed into alignment. A lot of us, by virtue of lining up with some pretty difficult things in our life, seeing as how there's nothing that catalyzes people into alignment better than pain does, so that's sort of the, the sad side of the story. <laughs> the positive side of the story is what will happen once people find alignment. But people who are highly resistant are going to find that alignment by virtue of suffering, basically. Which is why so many of us have chose to come down during this time to help people to find that alignment. Also, the most I think the most important thing that's coming of this vibrational change is the fact that all of our shadow aspects are surfacing. The darker sides of our psyche are subconscious. We can no longer bury them. So for generations, for thousands of years even, human beings have been able to separate the consciousness from the subconsciousness. We could call it the the sacred from the profane and sort of ignore what's going on with us. But that can't happen as we're increasing in vibration. Because obviously, if you're going to increase in vibration, you can't have these anchors. And we could consider shadow aspects or the subconscious an anchor. So those shadow aspects are going to be coming to the surface over and over again, which is why we could call this the the rapid time of change. Most people are going to start going through these very, very heightened states of facing their stuff, basically. Let's just say it that way. People are going to be facing all of the shadows of their childhood, facing all of the shadows of their personalities, and really going to have to deal with them instead of do what our grandparents' generation did, which was just bury those things and not have it affect your life much, not get a lot of expansion, these sort of things. It's not an option that's available to those of us that are alive today, which is good news. (laughs) So would you say the people who are um, psychic intuitives, would you say that they're feeling both that bad time, some bad things are going to happen, like volcanoes going off and things like that, earth changes, but also that 
the there's a feeling of excitement of anticipation like this is going to be great is that an accurate reading of of the energies yes i would say so but it is quite difficult for even those who are highly intuitive to separate themselves from their own shadow aspects so it's difficult for most of us when when our own shadow aspects are coming to the forefront for us to have an accurate read on what's going on in the earth. So the answer is, for some of us, it will be us perceiving what's going on with us. For some of us, it might be perceiving what's going on in the greater aspects of humanity in the earth. Okay, right. My next question is, have we begun a new stage where humans are becoming more in alignment with source? Or is it just kind of an ongoing thing? Oh, hell yes. We have definitely begun a new stage. We call it turning the corner. For years and years, we've been learning what source is. We've been learning unity by virtue of us becoming disconnected. So we have separated ourselves to a certain extent, the furthest extent so far, to the degree where most of us have delivered the desire for unification. And that mass desire, which has arised from human consciousness in and of itself so you've got individual consciousness but you've also got the collective human consciousness and the collective human consciousness has desired realignment with source has desired unity and oneness to such a degree that that desire is actually pulling us around the corner back towards total unification so we could say back towards pure alignment with source energy so the answer to that question is hell yes great um, chipper has the next question I, just to continue on with that, I, it sounds like what I, I, I think in cycles a lot. And so uh, you, you go out and you come in and you go out and you come in. And it sounds as if what you just said is similar to reaching that farthest point out of, of separation from source. And now we're, we've, we've turned that corner and are coming back in. Yes. Would that be a similar description that you just gave? Oh, yes. That's a very, very accurate description. <laughs> and to, to try to tie that into the question that I've got is it's an individual process, obviously. I mean, we, we each come to, into our own consciousness as we come into our own consciousness. And then we look around and we say, well, how can... How can I assist in this and find people that we do that with and, and run into to different groupings throughout lifetimes? Uh, and can you talk about that, that stage of individual groupings? I mean, there was a slash in between individual and group, but I, it's a... To, I haven't been able to come up with a, a, an adequate description to talk to myself about it yet. So I'm, I'm looking for any, anything you've got on that. Can you hone the question a little bit in terms of... <clears throat> well, when, as, I've, as I've gone in my own process mm -hmm. and have, have diligently cultivated that shadow into something that actually rises up into consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I've gone, I've, I've found more frequently than I've gone looking for groups. And I, I am involved in a group and, and after, <sighs> after a level of awareness is reached within myself, then that group takes on even more significance to me. And I was, uh, somehow it feels important, it, to me it feels important that as individuals become more aware, as I as an individual become more aware and conscious, that it behooves my progress as well as concurrent progress of those people with whom I come in rapport. It's not really a question. I'm, I, <laughs> <laughs> can you talk about group aspects of consciousness or if? Well, anytime you bring multiple perspectives together, you have 
much more chance for expansion. And it helps you to hone your preferences even more because to stay in alignment with yourself is difficult when you add one person, even more difficult when you add two people and three people and four people and so on. Right. And so it catapults us towards even further and further alignment with ourselves. Because any of you who've been in a relationship or formed a business maybe or a relationship with a group of people know how hard it is to keep everybody in alignment with everyone else. You can't do it. And so you find a way basically to come into alignment with yourself and yourself only. And it's sort of the roundabout way to teach you that if you manage to come into alignment with yourself, then everyone who is, who is around you will manage to come into alignment with you. So that's sort of the easy way of going about it rather than the hard way of going about it, which is to try to round everybody up and get them to vibrate at the same frequency. Right. You just let the universe arrange for you that which is a vibrational match to you by becoming a, the vibration of whatever you want to be. So if I find my own alignment, I can allow the universe to bring me people who vibrate at that same frequency as I do. And by virtue of spending time around these people, I will have a new platform from which to give rise to new desires. And once I line up with those desires, that is further expansion and another platform for me to desire new things within this universe. All right. There's there's nothing quite like multiple perspectives to help us to find the universal expansion which we're seeking. When you were saying uh, allow that coming into fuller consciousness within myself uh, mm -hmm. and that draws that similar frequency, um, I have a difficult time living out of my eye, if you, if you might get a feel for what I'm trying to say. Um, and so I, I hold back on some of that expression of myself in order to not um, impose on others. Ah, this is self-rejection that we're discussing. Any time yeah. that you talk of attitude is self-rejection. The problem is that if you are in an attitude of self-rejection, all you can line up with with a group full of people is them rejecting you. They're going to mirror any sort of attitude you have towards yourself. Well, thank you. <laughs> Isn't life fun? No. It is. <laughs> it depends on the day, doesn't it? Let's be honest. It depends on the day whether it's It awesome. depends on the minute of the day for me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, it's, it's a constant fluctuating uh, need to pay attention, I find. And... Sometimes I, it's difficult to pay that close attention to what has become an overwhelming urge for, for that uh, development. Yes. This is the benefit of groups. The benefit of groups or other people, other beings, is that they will become the reflection of whatever is inside you. That's why we say that one of the best spiritual practices you can do is reversing things back on yourself. So anytime you have a judgment, something like, that person hates me, reverse it back on yourself and say, I hate me, and how might that be more true? And you'll find those ways, and you'll understand that those people are doing nothing but reflecting a truth that's in you. So we could go about it the hard way and try to get them to like us, which is never going to work because we haven't changed the vibration which is reflecting in the mirror. Or we can find ways to fall in love with ourselves, find ways to approve of who we are, and those people who will not accept us will fade out of our experience, or else they will come to like us, because they are only going to be able to be a vibrational match to us if they are to share the same space. Yeah. I, 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 we're, we're, I sense trouble in your voice. No, I, I again, I... I, I feel myself as a, as a unit of consciousness that is doing what, you're, what you've just said, is, is exposing, uh, I, I don't, the trouble is not being able to express what I feel and see. And ah. so I, I end up doing little nursery rhymes because that is the quickest self mirror I've been able to figure out, and it 
<laughs> not <laughs> wanting to put judgment on the experience uh, of seeing the universe out of this focal point of consciousness because mm -hmm. I realize that each of us is that focal point of consciousness. Or I, that's the story I tell myself. I mean, well, it's, I, it's a good idea to separate oneself from the judgmental mind, but the problem is, is you came here to judge. My joke is that opening your eyes and saying, that's a wall, is a judgment. It's a judgment with, which limits ultimately the essence of what something is. So anytime you judge anything as what it is, you're limiting it. But that's essentially what you came here to do in this physical body. So when people judge you or when you judge other things, you're doing your job. The trick is to be able to switch back and forth between the perspectives, the perspective of judging and the perspective of being able to remove yourself from that judgment. We didn't come here so as to, in these imperfect human bodies, imperfect human perspectives, in order to fully take on the perfection of eternal perspective. Right. What you came here to do is experience both, because from eternal perspective, the judgment which we experience in these physical bodies is perfect. It's part of the perfection. Yeah. I... Here's a question. Why do you feel like it is so important to express yourself to other people? I, it's not so much express myself to other people. It's it just express. It, it, it is just, uh, I guess, to uh, see the experiencing as it's occurring. I, I you talk about putting, uh, taking the another viewpoint, and I, I do that again on a momentary basis. I, I have troubles getting so caught up in in the thoughts that arise when I discuss things like this that I go all over the place and can't be very coherent. So. That's okay, because on one level, you were 100% understanding and pulling in all of this information. Sometimes the brain is formed in such a way that it has a difficult time conveying that information into verbiage. But no matter what somebody is thinking about, these kinds of messages, they do hit home because there are multiple levels of you that are listening to this conversation. Right. <laughs> Well, this level says thank you for that question answer. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, this is Sabelle. Chipper's question brought to mind another question for me. I have experienced in school group projects where everyone dreaded them. Then I've experienced meditation groups where you could go so much farther than you could go by yourself. So they're almost diametrically opposed experiences. I've also had the experience of trying to develop spiritually by myself, and now I find that I can develop so much more and faster in a forward-moving group. How is it that a group can be something that you dread or something that lifts you up? How much of our input makes it that way? Or is it about choosing the right people or attracting the right people? It's 100% our focus that makes it that way. When we are assigned, usually when we're in school, we're assigned projects we don't actually want to do. And so already we've got our focus oriented in the wrong direction in terms of the project itself. And okay. so it's just a match that what's going to build on top of that is the dread of trying to get somebody else to collaborate on something we already don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No wonder. We, yeah. we naturally inclined towards group. The human, when we come into the human perspective, part of the human perspective is coming into the perspective of a being that is group oriented. We are incredibly social beings as humans. The frequency of human is incredibly communal. And so it's only natural that we would want people to align with us. We want other people to agree with us, share the same frequency as us, explore the same planet with us. The thing is, our focus our expectation about those interactions is what sets up our group interaction. So we may expect that other people will not receive us well, and so our group interactions will not go well. But usually when we 
are looking at the aspect that somebody might agree with us. Let's say they were going to get together for a spiritual meeting. You already know that this person is spiritual in nature and thus has something in common with you. And so your basic expectation is that they're going to receive you well. So it's all the orientation of our focus and our expectation that makes these group interactions either negative in nature or positive in nature. Okay. You could, if you really oriented your focus appropriately, you could make a fabulous good time out of, let's say, doing a project with someone that you consider to be your worst enemy. Assuming that you could erase for a time the focus on the fact that they are your enemy and instead milk the positive out of the situation for all it's worth. But that's an intense focus that you have to achieve in order to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that takes some uh, internal fortitude. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, it, what, instead of saying internal fortitude, it takes it takes people being intense enough in their commitment to being happy. So if I care enough how I feel, then I'm going to think in a way relative to everything that makes me feel good. Not because of any large spiritual truth, but because I care about feeling good. And that caring is really all it takes for a person to decide to focus in a way that is positive rather than any serious internal fortitude. <laughs> well, I guess what I mean by that is holding on to your commitment to happiness when you have all these other energies around you. Maybe it's not as hard as I think. Yeah, that's more the real truth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all righty. So my next question is there anything you sense about this group or about the people that will be listening to this interview? Yes, we've got an entire group of commitment phobes. <laughs> um, if we're talking about the collective vibration that this group shares when it comes to shadow work, it's that everybody in this group so far has an issue with commitment. And that doesn't necessarily mean just in relationships, but it does spill over into relationships. And any time somebody has an issue with commitment, it's because they're sort of pulling for a freedom that they are convinced doesn't exist if they commit to something. But the ironic part is it's a freedom that already does exist. See, we are all free. You can change your mind at any moment, but to most people who will be listening to this and the people who are on the call right now, committing 100% to something usually means a feeling of losing your freedom. And so... Most of the people in this group like to leave one foot in and one foot out of any commitments that they make to things. It's just a collective vibration of fear that is coming across quite strong right now. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Now you've got me wondering whether my next question is a commitment phobia or a follow-up question. <laughs> I was wondering about fading um, people fading in, in and out of your life or out of your life and in my life, I've gone through life and I've had friends and then I've moved on and I've had friends and I've moved on. And I was wondering if that's a changing a um, vibration and, and that's just moving on and that's why they're fading out of my life as opposed to having like childhood friends who you keep forever and stay in contact with. It's a bit of both when it comes to you, which means it's a mixed vibration. Part of why you have fallen out of contact with people is because of this fear of committing to people. Um, what you fear essentially is handing your happiness over to them. So you've got two groups of people. You've got the groups of people who are the ones who like to trust other people and then blame them for what goes on. That means, okay, you're responsible for my happiness. Now you've gone and cheated on me. And because I gave you my happiness and made my happiness dependent on your behavior, now I'm super angry and it's your fault. Those people are not commitment phobes. Those are the people who hand over their their happiness willingly. You, the people in this phone call, are the opposite of that, where I don't want to hand my happiness over to other people. Instead, I want to basically not base my happiness on these people at all, and I have a hard enough time believing that I can control my own happiness regardless of what they do, so I'd rather just not really invest it in people in the first place. That's the non-commitment part. But that's only part of it. So you've got a mixed vibration, meaning part of it is that commitment issue, and the other part of it is the fact that as your frequency has increased, you have become not a match of these people. 
So you've got both going on. And it is quite common when we raise our frequency that one of two things happens. Either the people that are in our experience raise their frequency as well, and so we remain a match, or else they fade out of our experience and that space is replaced by people who match our new frequency. This is where it gets so fun. See, we get to sort of look at what aspects of these things are coming from a negative place and a positive place. And quite often you do have these mixed vibrations where part of it is coming from a positive vibrational space and part of it is coming from a negative vibrational space. And so all that needs to happen is we need to release resistance to the portion that is coming as a result of the negative focus and allow ourselves to flow in the direction purely of what is a positive focus for us. Great. Thank you for pointing that out. My next question is on the core belief exercise and how do you know when you've gotten to the core belief? Well, you'll notice if you're doing the core belief exercises that you hit multiple core beliefs on the way. So you're going to, there's sort of one word statements, basically. You'll keep coming up with a statement every single time you answer that question, what would that mean to me or why would that be so bad? Each one of those is a core belief. But when what we're talking about here is the root core belief, which is the very bottom. And that's going to be immediately obvious because you're going to get an emotional release. So the minute you write down that root core belief, which is going to be the very last thing after you keep asking that question until you can't go any further, basically, you're going to get this intense settling, emotional settling feeling where oftentimes it does cause people to cry or it causes people to get that, oh my gosh, there it is feeling. If you don't get that feeling, then you haven't reached it yet. So it's your emotional guidance system which is going to indicate whether you've gotten to that core belief or not. Okay, great. Thank you. And can you explain luck, deja vu, and hope, and how those work or don't work? <laughs> yeah, of course. All right, let's start with deja vu. These are totally different things, so let's start with deja vu. Deja vu is one of two things. Either you have raised your frequency to such a degree that you are perceiving things that were a part of your own previous lives. So you can basically be, let's say you're walking around in another country and you happen to run across this deja vu feeling. That could be potentially because you have lived there before and in your enjoyment of this space, you managed to raise your frequency high enough that you were a match to the Akashic record. That's one option. The more common option though, when it comes to deja vu, is where before you come into the physical body, you are in non-physical. And from non-physical, you are not limited in terms of your perspective at all. And so as you are observing the potential life path that you're going to take, you take note of all the potentials which are a match to that original decision. So let's say that I chose to come down to these parents that I came down to in this life. I would be looking at all potential life paths that could originate from that one original choice. And I would be taking note of these life paths by virtue of highlights, I guess, turning points. Kind of like if you were to scan through a photo album really, really quickly, some of those photos would stick out to you if you were to flip through it quickly and others would not. You would get deja vu if you managed to line up with one of those potential life paths that you saw previous to coming into the physical and you were remembering seeing that event. So let's say that as my non-physical self was scanning through the potentials of the life path that I chose, this one moment, this one moment where I'm driving the car down this road, I saw that from non-physical perspective. I'm now having the memory of that observance of that potential, which I am now taking. So it's no longer a potential. It is a potential which I have activated. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, so luck. There is no such thing as luck. Luck is just our misinterpretation of the law of attraction. Luck is what people tell themselves when they are convinced that they don't create their own reality, but they're observing the law of attraction. Does that okay. make sense? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So what are, we, what are we curious about relative to hope? You know, it's my husband's question, and I really have no idea. Well, hope could be seen as an emotion which exists on the emotional scale. So if you're looking at emotions in terms of frequency, hope is a little bit below optimism. 
So that's what we have to say about hope. <laughs> okay. You know, he may be thinking of hope as in hoping something will happen rather than actually manifesting it. Oh, yeah, hope, hope, is, um, hope is not the highest of vibrational states. It is, a, it is a high vibration, but it is not as high as anticipation. It is not as high as expectation of something to occur. Hope still puts the power in somebody else's hands. Even the word hope means that I do not control my reality, but I am basically putting the energy in somebody else's hands with a positive intention. <laughs> Okay, my next question is on manifesting and whether we're actually required to do anything for manifesting. So if I have the money to purchase something I want and I decide to manifest that item, am I interfering by going out and buying the item? Oh, hell no. In fact, that's why you came down to the physical. We're in the physical so we can line up with these manifestations. This is a really difficult thing for a lot of people to understand because when we think of manifesting, we think of something popping up out of thin air, but that's not the way the universe sees manifestation. Manifestation is, we could, let's just play the game, we could manifest things out of thin air if we wanted to, but it would actually be less fun than the lining up with it. It's like, why would you go on a run? Because it feels good to move your body. So it feels good to take action from inspiration and that's the only action we really should be taking so we the universe would consider it like this if you give rise to a desire let's say that you desire to buy this new car if you basically line up with that if you feel the positive inspiration to go take your money and go buy that car that is seen as manifestation you're still lining up with that car it's just we always like it better when we're able to manifest things when it becomes more obvious that it's not that it's more like a a co-creation on behalf of the universe and us and even though it's always a co-creation on behalf of the universe and us it's easier to see that co-creation when say we don't have the money to go buy that car but we manifest it anyways meaning let's say we have no money and we really want this car and so we keep focusing on the car keep lining up with it keep feeling positive about it thinking positive thoughts about it and then suddenly somebody leaves us twelve thousand dollars and we spend that money on the car that is seen as more of a manifestation even though universally it is no more a manifestation than the original where we already had the money we went out found the car and bought it so you're not oh, the answer is you're not getting in the way at all of this universe your as long as your positive emotion is registering relative to lining up with that thing then what is happening is you are taking inspired action which is what you were planning to do down here in the physical the only way you can really get in the way of manifestation is by thinking thoughts that pull in the opposite direction of the manifestation. So let's say I want a car. If I continue to think thoughts like I don't have enough money, if I continue to think thoughts like I've never seen a car like that in my life, if I think thoughts like, oh, none of my neighbors have nice cars like that, this will never happen to me. That's the only way you can get in the way of manifestation. In fact, one of the best ways to enable manifestation is to learn how to act on inspired action, meaning you have to notice that sensation inside of you of inspiration and then take action from that place that is the best way to line up with manifestation it's in, in no way getting in the way of it okay great i believe brian has the next question hi teal can you hear me yeah i've been reading george anderson's latest book george is a medium that communicates with the souls who've passed on he kind of facilitates a connection between them and their loved ones. And when he talks about the nature of our lifetimes on earth, he stresses the life lessons that we set up for ourselves before we come into our lifetimes. You know, you might think of it like earning an advanced degree where you plan a series of requisite courses in order to graduate. And while George does stress the nature of our free will, he also suggests that a great deal of our lives, maybe even most of our lives, are planned out before we, we even get here. How does that jibe with the law of attraction and our ability to set our own course while we're here in body, if you will? In other words, to what degree is predestined and to what degree is our life a result of free will? So, for example, if someone achieves a state where you're completely positive, emitting a high frequency, happy vibe almost constantly, I mean, you're really raising your frequency pretty high, 
but you have these life lessons coming up that, you know, they're really tough and stressful. Which one is going to trump the other? Oh, this is a serious question. I love it. Um, so <laughs> the problem that we have here is the language that we're using. Because the way that we set up our lives, it is true that we have to set an intention. We wouldn't even be here if our higher selves did not have some kind of an intention. So we could call that a learning intention. The problem is, is that in order to, to involve verbiage as if we've set out this course in order to graduate, we would have to understand what the ultimative, what the outcome is, and we don't. We set forth the intention having no idea what we're going to find and no idea what that's going to inspire us towards. We just know that it's going to enable expansion one way or the other. And so while you, I mean, it, it varies based on person to person also. You may choose much more of your life than another person does of their life pre to coming here. But it's still, the truth still remains the same, that when you get here, you have a choice to stay in alignment with those original intentions or to give rise to totally new intentions. And it's something that your higher self will accept immediately because if you have chosen something new to desire, then that is the indication to your higher self that there is something else that is in further alignment with your own expansion. So it's not like we are playing ourselves down here like chess pieces, and it's not like we've set up this idea of what we need to learn, and now we're sending down this being in order to learn what we already know. That would defy expansion in the first place, which is why the previous model of how spirituality has worked here with God and humans has not really worked. So you know that in the Christian religion, basically, there's this idea that that God already understands perfection. And here we are, humans, separate from God, that are down here learning how to catch up to that kind of perfection. And it doesn't work that way at all. How it is is that in our physical lives here, we are setting up what perfection looks like. We are defining through what I was you know, explaining earlier where you give rise to new preferences. Anytime a human or any other being has the sensation of desire emitting from them, the universe joins that vibration, becomes that vibration, and says, ah, this is more of what I am. This is more of what perfection is. And so it's almost like we are down here designing our degree as we go. There is nothing that we're down here to quote unquote achieve. So you're able to change what you are learning here. You're able to change your destiny all moments of the day, no matter what. And so let's say that if you were to achieve a, a state of pure positive emotion where you're emitting a high frequency, you could not be a match to a negative life lesson if you were in that frequency. It would not be possible. The only reason that you would experience any kind of negative thing is if there were aspects of you that were not high in frequency. Right, okay. In this example where you maybe have a life lesson that's coming in and you have this high frequency, is that lesson still going to happen? And are you going to not you know, experience it in the same way? Or is it just that you, you can you mitigate the experience or life lesson altogether? <laughs> you can mitigate it because the reason that the life lesson would occur is to help you find more alignment. But if you're already in alignment, there's no reason to experience that type of life lesson. But this is the sort of this is the reason that you choose to begin with. And when we're talking about destiny, let's say you choose to come into a family that's particularly damaging to your self concept. You would choose that family because you know that you can find more alignment if you are to experience what that lack of alignment feels like. That makes sense. One of the things I noticed since the first time I interviewed you and the more I've absorbed your information, I've noticed that I've changed my own frequency. I'm a lot more positive. I'm attracting a lot better things. And so I like to keep it on a roll and not to be a match for those negative type of experiences. Oh, good. And the best way to go about that is to release resistance to them. Precisely. That's part of my affirmation is trusting the universe and, and completely and allowing whatever comes in and knowing that it's for the greater good, whether I understand what the greater good is in that moment or not. Completely. The minute that we change the meaning of something, we can't experience it in the same way. So 
let's say that you, because by virtue of your current vibration, managed to line up with something which was not so enjoyable for you to line up with. It is going to be less enjoyable if you resist it, more enjoyable if you see it as an opportunity. So it's always the meaning that you are attaching to the experience that causes you to either be out of alignment or to be in alignment. It, it, it's, this is difficult for most physical humans to understand, but if you experience something that is not so enjoyable, that is giving rise to something which you'd prefer. In fact, you couldn't even have that negative emotion relative to the thing if you had not already delivered your preference. So you wouldn't have any emotion relative to the experience if, you, if that experience hadn't caused you already to define what you would prefer. So most people, if they consciously line up with they, what they prefer, so they say, okay, what am I experiencing? All right, I know that I don't want fill in the blank, which lets me know that I do want fill in the blank and then focus on that. You wouldn't actually feel suffering. You might feel what we call negative vibration, but suffering is the result of keeping yourself a match to something which is so far out of alignment with your desire, so far out of alignment with your higher self, with your source self, that you feel the discord in that resistance. But we don't have to have that resistance if we're treating these negative things the way they're meant to be treated, which is the negative exists to show me what I would prefer. I like to think that I already know what I prefer so that the negative experiences stay to a minimum, but I'm always open to that redirection and reclarification. Oh, good. Thank, thank you. Gio, how can we teach our kids that they create our, their own reality? Because I'm getting the, I can't, it will, it will never work, and it's someone else's fault. Like, it's your fault, Daddy. It's your fault, Mommy. It's your fault, you know, those things from them. The best way to teach your kids to create their own reality is to demonstrate it, and that's the major problem is that most parents who desperately want their children to create their own reality and to know that they do have doubts themselves and don't behave as if they do create their own reality. So here's the major problem, and this is really – I'm presenting information here which is pretty difficult for most parents nowadays to line up with, but – Let's say that you try to teach your kid that you create your own reality, but then you get a bunch of bills in the mail and they overhear you and, and your partner arguing about the fact that, that you've got these bills in the mail. Do you see how that presents a dichotomy in the child's mind between I create my own reality and reality happens to me? Oh, yeah. even, so even something that small is going to convince children that they don't create their own reality. So... It's a, there is no other way, basically, to teach your children that they create their own reality than to get damn serious about creating your own reality and demonstrating that to them. So let's say you get the bills in the mail. Oh, look, I managed to manifest something interesting today. I wonder what I should do about it. And then you may go to your kids. Hey, I've got a question because mommy's a little frustrated about this. What should I do, do you think, to create what I want to see in the mail, not bills, instead of bills. So you can involve them in it. It's just we're being deliberate about what they're seeing and not seeing so that they don't adopt the same behavior that we have. And ultimately, when you, let's say you open mail, you know, bills in the mail and you have a little bit of a fit in front of them, there is no way to back your way out of the, the reality, which is that your vibration in that moment is, I didn't do this. I did not create this. Somebody is doing this to me because why else would I do this? They can read that vibration. Doesn't matter what you say to them. So I got a lot of work to do then. <laughs> oh, we all do. This is why I said this is a bit of a stretch. Sometimes it's a bit frustrating speaking to physical humans from non-physical perspective because of this kind of thing. Most of us are so used to the way that we handle situations that we wouldn't even think of minute interactions like that. Mm -hmm. But that is what's teaching our children. Okay, and then as a follow-up is, how can we help them recognize and use their intuition? Well, the ironic part is if we wouldn't train them out of it, they would use it naturally on their own. <laughs> um, basically, we want to get them in touch with their own emotional guidance system. we got to teach them to trust their own emotions, not to trust what we want them to do. And so you want to get them thinking at a very young age. That means that when they look to mommy or daddy to tell them the answer to whatever question they're seeking, 
you say, I don't know. Why don't you think about it? Why don't you ask the universe about it? You sort of turn it back on themselves so they get in the habit of asking their own themselves instead of seeking answers externally. And also, like, let's say that they get invited to a, a birthday party. You can sit down with them and say, OK, I want you to tell me the truth. How do you feel emotionally? Do you feel good about this emotionally or not so good about this emotionally? And if they say good, then that's your indication. It's in alignment. You can take them and then they learn from their own expansion. But if they say not good, say, OK, why are you feeling not good about this? What are you thinking about it? And you can get them to a point where they can connect the dots between what they're thinking and their emotional selves. Putting them in touch with their own emotional guidance system is absolutely everything, because that is when we're talking about intuition, that is the number one intuitive connection that we have to our source selves, to our higher selves, is our emotions mm -hmm. and our thoughts. OK, I think Brian has the next question. Hi, Teal. I wonder if you could speak about animals and specifically about pets and the role they play in our lives. They seem to have, you know, they live lives of service and giving unconditional love. Yet I've never heard, you know, that, that they they evolve spiritually the same way as humans do. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the, about their soul paths. Awesome. All right. So animals do not come down into the same perspective. Obviously, their perspective is serving the expansion of the universe. So ultimately, they do evolve spiritually in a similar way that humans do. They, through their experience of physical life are giving rise to preferences and those preferences are also lined up with in terms of the greater portion of the universe at large but what's interesting is is a lot of times when beings choose to come down as animal they choose to come down as part of what is creating the balance here so there's a there's a basis of balance that happens through our flora and fauna even here on the planet and so you could see the when we're talking about the animal kingdom, you're looking at a very stable vibration, which actually enables human expansion. Because humans come down into a perspective which is rarely ever balanced, and that benefits us because there's more expansion coming from us. Meaning humans have a lot more resistance, and they give rise to a lot stronger desires. Whereas animals are more allowing in general. They don't have as big of desires and as many desires, and they don't have as much resistance. So there's actually less expansion that is coming through them than is coming through a physical human. I wonder if you can make a distinction between just animals in general and, say, pets who are you know, a, a person's companion, who there's, there, there's a bond there that's beyond just, say, an animal that would, would pass by or wouldn't, that wouldn't necessarily bond with a human. Okay, there's very much difference, and it all it has to do with the the pre-birth intention of these beings. When beings come down into a situation where they're interacting with humans, either as pets or you know something like this, they are actually opting for a lot bigger alignment because they get to more like a spiritual guide. Um, you know how we have the non-physical guides, more like a non-physical guide. Part of their expansion is coming through the observance of us. So as your dog sees you fighting with your spouse, they are giving rise to the desire for harmony. And because they are so allowing, they're able to line up with it quicker. So they're actually adding to our alignment. This is, this is especially true for animals who are, we could call them service-oriented pets, where when they interact with somebody who is in a state of ailment, they are able to give rise to the desire for the person to find alignment, to find health, and they allow it to such a degree that their frequency is so high that quite often they cause the human to come into alignment with that perspective which they have given rise to, that desire. And that's why you watch so often when service pets are in, in the space of somebody who's ill, that person will start getting steadily better and better because the strong, intense vibration of that pet is actually causing them to align with the pet's energy. A lot of times we come down into these experiences and we could call this a pre-birth contract. I hate the word contract, but it's, it's what humans use to describe this interaction. Quite often you'll meet an animal in your, over the course of your life that you just, you hit it off with to such a degree that there's a soul recognition. And quite often this is an, a type of agreement that we make 
before this birth in order to come down and for them to help facilitate our path and our intentions because it simultaneously serves their intentions. So the only reason anybody would come into contact with each other, human to human, dog to human, or dog to dog, is because that interaction serves expansion in some way. So either it serves expansion because they are the contrast that's causing you to hone the preference, or you're coming into contact with them because you have honed all these preferences and they are here to help you line up with those preferences. My co-author, Robert Bruce, suggests that when you, when a human loves an animal, that that vibration is raising their vibration and, in fact, give, putting them on a different soul path. Is that accurate? Putting, putting which one on a different soul path? The, the animal. So as opposed from an animal that, for example, a cat, a cat that may be an alley cat that, and, or a wild type of <laughs> feral okay. cat that was always, for example, always in the wild. And then maybe it comes into contact with a human and adopts the human and vice versa. And the love that they share catapults that animal into a, a different spiritual path because the, the love is changing their frequency. Is that your understanding of it? Is that accurate? Any kind of love and connection is causing an increase in frequency no matter what. It's just I have very rarely seen it work that way with animals because your your beings, which are the most in alignment, which hold the highest frequency, are often the ones that have no contact with human beings. That may sound very harsh, but it is more common for animals that are around humans to be the ones that are imbalanced. This is why you don't see the humans like to tell the story that you don't see all kinds of animals like wolves in the wild developing cancer because they all die and get eaten. That's not actually accurate. What's accurate is that these animals like your common house cat or house dog develop cancers and cysts and tumors by virtue of spending time with humans that are out of alignment. Right, they're so, taking on our, our energy and, and, yes. and manifesting it, right? <laughs> yes. Sure. <laughs> That's why there, it's, it's not a joke, but in dog training, you'll learn the truth that your dog is your greatest reflection of the owner. And it's because they are so allowing. They're, allowing is good in one respect. It's good because animals, being the allowing creatures that they are, find it very easy to come into alignment with their eternal aspect and thus not get as separated from their source cells as humans get. But it, it is not so great when they're surrounded with a, with a physical human that is out of alignment because quite often they allow themselves to come out of alignment and to match our frequency. So it sounds like it's more likely to be a, a pre-life agreement to come into contact with a human, maybe to put them in more alignment rather than uh, the human affecting them and, and putting them on a more uh, a higher plane. Is that? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. In fact, it usually works the other way around. <laughs> right. That makes perfect sense. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Teal. This is Gemini, and we're going to move on to the topic of emotional growth. And I want to know if one can evolve through just joyous experiences versus unenjoyable experiences. You cannot evolve through purely positive experiences, but... What we this is our whole problem where we got to separate negative and positive that which is wanted and that which is unwanted from that which causes suffering and that which causes joy. Because you can learn through purely and purely have a joyous experience, but there would still be that which we call negative involved in the joyous experience. This is a problem with the way that humans in general look at negative versus positive experiences. So it is possible if you were to hold the right perspective that you could still experience that which is unwanted, but not be thinking about that which is unwanted in such a way that it caused you to feel negative emotion. So you could experience something that was that was unwanted in nature and be thinking about that thing which is unwanted in a in alignment way to such a degree that all you would experience was joy. So you could move through all of life with joy, but you would still have experiences which you call unwanted. So we need to separate our concept of the experience of joy from the experience of, you know, contrast or challenge. 
which is something that most people are not willing to do because they link them together so much because we're so used to resisting these these negative experiences instead of embracing them and seeing them as opportunities we resist them and so we associate challenging and negative experiences with suffering okay and so how would one shift their vibration to be more aware in alignment of seeing the joyous aspect versus the painful or challenging aspect of it. You learn deliberate focus and you learn how to pivot, meaning that if you experience, I was said about a little bit about this earlier. Let's say you're experiencing a negative emotion or a negative experience. There goes my dog. Okay, let's say that you're, can I let my puppy out really fast? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay. He's, he's bigger than me, and so when he gets up, he makes more noise than, okay. than an adult man. Okay. All right, where was I? No, I can't remember. Oh, we were just talking about how one can shift their vibration to that okay. joy. All right, so let's say that you were to experience something which you called challenging, something which was unwanted. You would, in that moment, look for every positive aspect within that situation, and you would also allow that to inspire you towards what you want. So you let's say that you are getting a divorce. A, you list every positive aspect relative to the divorce itself, relative to all people involved, and then you say, okay, I am having a breakup with this person. What does that cause me to know that I want? And that could be a huge list of things. So let's say that that's caused me to know that I want to find somebody in my life who resonates at such a similar frequency that they fill in the blank. Then you would turn your attention 100% to those things which this experience has caused you to know that you want. And you would focus on that 100%. You, you might do um, visualizations where you're thinking about what that experience would be like. What would it be like to be in the room with somebody who totally loved me for me? What would it be like to have a partner who completely aligned with my own spiritual growth and who was on their own path and who was really in this with me? And you put yourself in that end state. So all you're doing basically is allowing the negative to be what it was meant to be, which is that which inspires you towards a desire. Instead of holding yourself a match to it by resisting aspects about it or focusing on aspects that you don't like. And so you'd have to pay attention to how you feel because you'd want to think any thought and pay attention to anything that caused you to feel emotionally better. And if you're doing that, obviously you can move through something in a state of joy. Thank you, Till. Sabelle's up next. Earlier you were talking about commitment and commitment phobes, and I'm thinking of committing to happiness <laughs> and I'm not sure if commitment phobe falls into that category as well oh uh, yes it does does it okay <laughs> so my question is is what are the common things that derail us um, that pull us out of joy that um, how can we increase our consciousness about what derails us and okay good you ready for this I'm gonna frustrate everybody okay Okay, there is only one thing, literally only one thing, that derails us from joy. That okay. is that we place our focus, i.e. we pay attention to things which do not feel emotionally good to us. We focus on, hold beliefs, and pay attention to things which do not vibrate at the same frequency as our desires, at the same frequency as our higher selves. So it's what pulls us out of joy is putting our attention on anything that doesn't feel good to look at. It's really that simple. So, so the it's practice like this. is let's okay. pretend that I'm in a jail. This is my favorite favorite thing to use. It's a, it's a really accurate description. So let's say that I'm stuck in jail. By all means, I've got myself lined up with something that is absolutely terrible to experience, right? I have an option. And I could be in this jail cell and be in a state of joy, or I could be in this jail cell and be in an aspect of absolute suffering and misery. And the only difference between the person that experiences misery and the person that experiences joy is the person who experiences joy is sitting in sight of this jail cell focused on the moonlight that's coming through the jail cell window. The person who's miserable is focusing on the fact that they are not free. Does that make sense? Yeah, so... So I'm just thinking of, of the practice of noticing that. Would you like a personal personal example? Okay, yeah. 
this is really something which is, until we're brave enough to switch the orientation of our focus, this is a very difficult thing to understand. But let's just go here. Okay, when I was a young child, I was stuck for hours and hours on end down in this hole in the ground that was called the mind space. And it was lined with stinging nettle, and I was usually naked. And I was left out there for God knows how long, because I never knew when I was going to get out. And the man who had put me down in this hole over and over again was a sociopath who, on multiple occasions, I watched him actually kill children. So I had no idea whether I was going to meet with a terrible end. I had no idea whether he was going to kill me nicely, whether he was going to kill me at all, whether he was going to let me go. I had no idea what my fate was, and I was absolutely miserable. Miserable to no end. So sitting down in this hole, I learned a very valuable lesson about focus with, and how that relates to, of course, maintaining joy or being pulled out of joy. I noticed that if I sat down in that hole and I started thinking about him potentially hacking my limbs off with a chainsaw, I would start to feel negative emotion. But I also learned that if I sat down in that hole and I started to look around my environment for things which I enjoyed looking at, like the ants that were meandering around and picking at things, or like the grass blades that were catching the sunlight, then instantaneously, just based on placing my focus on those things, my entire emotional situation would change. Now, was I out of the situation? Hell no. I was still in a situation where I could have been killed 10 minutes later if he had decided to. So nothing about my circumstance had changed. My emotions had changed purely based on the fact that I started focusing on something that felt good to focus on. That is how one maintains joy. And we would have you do this process because it helps you maintain joy, because it feels good. But here's the fun part about this whole situation. The minute that you can pull your focus off something that feels negative and put it on something that feels good, you are now a different vibration, so you're a match to different vibrational things. So if you would like to get out of the jail cell or get out of the hole where the sociopath is keeping you, you focus yourself on anything that feels good emotionally to focus on, and then you cannot be a match to something as negative as the jail cell or a match to something negative like a person killing you. Wow. So that probably saved you. Oh, 100%. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. That's why I'm teaching this whole damn thing is because I did it myself. Okay. <laughs> so, so then... I'm, I'm keep coming back to that word commitment. So if I'm committing to being happy or we're, you know, we have someone who says they're committing to be, ha why are people afraid to commit to be happy and focus on the positive and focus on things that feel good? Because you've been told that's not what life is about to such a degree. And in so many numbers growing up, basically that you're convinced that to commit to happiness is almost to be a bad person. That's what a lot of people think. So, and here's the other thing. It's a survival tactic. If I believe that I don't create my own reality, which, let's just go here. I've spoken to many, 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 many people in the spiritual field and been interviewed by many people. And it does not matter how deep we have ourselves invested in spiritual practice. It is a very rare person who actually believes, even if they teach it, that they create their own reality. And so we may have one foot in. Let's say most of us know, especially most of us sitting in this phone call, most of us know to some degree that we create our own reality. But our brains are pulling in the opposite direction every day, saying, no, you don't. Listen to what your mother said. Look at that random accident you saw when you were 17 years old. You saw that accident. Do you think that they created that? So your brain has lined up all kinds of proof that you do not create your own reality. So you've got a tug of war going on. And if you believe you don't create your own reality then your survival has to do with being able to see things before they blindside you. That's where worry comes from. Any kind of excessive focus on negative things is basically you thinking that if you see it before it's coming, if you can anticipate negative, then you can do something about it when it happens to you. And you see people who are happy as sort of sitting ducks where they're just sort of ignoring everything and they don't understand that they don't create their own reality, so they're not prepared and then suddenly strife strikes and they're totally out of luck. 
So your brain is trying to help you survive by convincing you that joy is definitely not the purpose of life here. And in fact, if you make it the purpose of life, you're probably going to die. That's why people have a difficult time committing to happiness. It's because yeah. they, don't, they don't think they create their own reality 100%. Because I could see in your situation... You know, if I had been in that situation out of the blue, I'd be thinking about how to get out, how to avoid ever getting put back in. Haha, <laughs> welcome you to know. the first 17 years of my life. That is, what yeah. I, that is what I spent 17 years doing, and guess what? I had to get to the point, this is why I'm doing this, because I hope people don't have to get to the same point I got to. I had to get to this point where I literally did not care anymore. I had nothing to lose. There was nothing that was going to happen. I was looking at, you know, death 24 hours a day. So it was like, whatever. I, this cliff that I think I'm going to jump off is not even a cliff anymore. It's like a molehill. So at that point, there's no risk anymore. So when there's no risk, you're miserable already. There's nothing else to do than to start focusing on positive crap. So I started doing that. <laughs> so I'm just hoping that people don't have to get to that point before they're willing to sort of take the risk and commit to their own joy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because I, I but thank you for that, because that, that really, I feel like I get, I get what you're talking about. Um, I have a weird example. I, I work with a lot of elderly. Ah. And, um, you know, they can get dementia and confused. And I have all these nurses who are fixing things around me. And they're like, oh, this is a problem. We have to fix it. They're, they're, they're going to get in so much trouble. It's, this is a disaster waiting to happen. And the old folks are, nope, I want to stay in my own home. They're, they're making bad judgments. They're confused, whatever. They're on toxic medications. If they make errors, I'll kill them. And I see them two years later, and they're still fine. <laughs> and the nurses are, why are they still fine? I'm like, I don't know. God loves them. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, that was what they're creating, I guess. Yes. I totally Thank pegged you for a nurse, by the way. <laughs> I'm a social worker. <laughs> oh, I I was like, I seriously, the minute I sat down, I, I listened to the way you talk, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm in the emergency room. Yeah, I get all the emergencies. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. As a reminder, you can learn more about Teal at her website, thespiritualcatalyst.com, where you can find information about her books, seminars, and more. This concludes part one of our two-part symposium with Teal Scott. 